You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Be part of the change. We are happy to announce the Griot Heroes Awards are returning in 2024. Nominate your heroes so we can celebrate people who are making a real impact. Nominations open on January 8th. Visit thegrio.com slash heroes today. And it went viral. Um, right. It was so viral, it went to the top of Tubi. And then they called my distributors and was like, we don't want nothing to do with this film. Really? We're not associated with this. Yes, we're not. So then they went out and put a tweet they, they or, or X. I don't know what, what you call it. Yeah, but, I don't know what to call um, it either. Yeah. They're like, that, yeah, that movie will be out no, November, never November, February, February 18th. Tubi did this? Yes. And then they put another one under that saying, we would never put nothing out like that. Never will, never have. So my distributor calls me and says, hey, Alvin, whatever you're posting right now, you need to take it down. Which got me in trouble, by the way. It wasn't even my fault. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Dear Culture, the podcast for Bite About the Culture here on the Real Black Podcast Network. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. And today we're talking black movies, black cinema, independent black films. And we even go talk a bit about Tubi. And we are joined today by a writer, director, actor, producer. Uh, I'm not sure what you don't do. I'm sure you can share that if we get to that point. But a, a an artist who has gone viral for some of his films, uh, the promo for some of the films at that, Mr. Alvin Gray. What's going on, bro? How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Man, I'm doing fine. Um, it's a it's a it's a beautiful day here in the nation's capital where I am, and you're in Baltimore, correct? Yep. You are a person who I came across because I watch a lot of black movies. Like I'm that person who watches black movies without a budget and black movies with the big budgets, right? Like I'll see the color purple, and then I'll watch a movie where they shooting people with air guns, um, <laughs> and I get just as much entertainment out of both because. Yep. I'm literally the person rooting for everybody black. Yeah. I came across a film on, I saw it on Tubi when I go, I scroll through Tubi and it said the nurse who saw the baby on the highway, right? Detectives say the 25 year old also stopped at a Target where she bought snacks that weren't found in her car when officers arrived. So I saw this and I was like, ain't no way. <laughs> ain't no way somebody made a movie about the Carly Russell story and especially because that just happened in like July or whatever that that wasn't July of 2023 it wasn't that long ago true story I was in Birmingham Alabama on I-59 a couple hours before that story broke oh, wow. I was driving to my parents house in Huntsville when that story actually broke so I feel a personal connection but <laughs> I gotta ask I just, I just I got I gotta start here uh -huh. What in the hell made you decide to make a movie about the Carly Russell story? Why did you make this film? Okay, so originally when I heard about this whole story on online, I um, felt really bad about the whole situation. You know, it pulled from my heartstrings a lot. I remember that night showing my wife the story saying, hey, look at this girl. Um, she was kidnapped. Um, something's wrong. It's, it, I feel heavy for her because as a director, um, whenever I hear stories, I immediately place myself in the room and into the character of that person to feel the emotions. So the whole time I was running through my head, this woman is getting suffocated, you know, or she's screaming, she's hollering, you know, clawing at the trunk. I, I was going through all these different emotions. And the next night I woke up um, in the middle of the night and all through TikTok, it's saying the person was found. So I'm like, uh, people just don't get found like that. But OK, I feel relieved. Um, and then. After a couple of days, more and more things started unfolding. And again, the director and me, I see things visually. And I'm like, this looks like a horror film. But at the same time, it looks like a parody, um, you know, because like the, right. the guy with the orange hair. So I'm like, this has to be told, you know, as, as, like, as a parody, as a thriller. It's just something quirky. And I had the tools to be able to complete this film. So I said, you know what? I think I want to make a parody about this because... Um, this is something that's just golden uh, in the community that we all knew about. So let me just use my tools to tell this story. Yeah, I got to admit, man, when I so when I saw it. The title of it, it, you know, it's one of those things where it seems so obvious. It's like, wow, like this makes so much sense. Right, right. The, the title, the nurse who saw the baby by the highway mm -hmm. nailed it. Right. 
I watched the movie. It's short. It's like you know, it's like forty eight minutes. It's not. It's not long. It's it's a thriller of like I noticed. Like you tend to live in a thriller, the thriller yeah. realm. That's is that like your preferred genre of of like filmmaking? That just happens to be. I just made a Christmas movie. It ended up being a dark tone movie. I so watched just, it. It was it was dark, bro. Like except <laughs> the end when you were dancing in New Balance, Orange New Balance. But it was I did watch it. I watched okay, that movie. Yeah. <laughs> so that tends to be, no matter how much I try to stray away. It was supposed to be a comedy, but it ended up being dark. Um, so, yeah, that's not my thing, but it's becoming my thing, not intentionally. When I started to watch it, I assumed it was going to be a comedy, right? That's how I, I, that's how I thought it was going to be. And I'm going into it, and I'm like, you know, everybody's playing this real straight. Now, I'm not saying people are playing this like they're trying to make a serious thriller kind of thing, but everybody, like, the, the comedy aspect is kind of funny, like, Wow, mm-hmm. this is wild. Not funny, like <laughs> like like laughing out of like laughing out loud. Yeah. But so, how long did it take to make this movie? From like once you decided to you were going to do this, how long did it to how long did it take to go from start to release? Yeah, I would say it took us maybe four days to shoot it, um, and that's because we were shooting it as the story was unfolding. So we would wake up and just watch the news and see what happens, go on TikTok and Instagram and just pull from stuff and made it our own. So um, once we understood what the assignment was that day or sometimes while we we're on the set we were learning stuff we would just say okay let's shoot it and um go home and edit and i would say like four or five days we were done and i gave it to my distributor which is funny because uh they had to film for about a month before releasing it so everyone was so set you know like oh it came out so fast i'm like really this movie was done in four or five days um it was just it sat in qc for about a good 25 30 days or so before it was actually released so wait, you were filming this while it was at, while the story was still unfolding? Yes, I treated it like the news stations, you know, like just go out, let's oh, shoot wow. it, let's edit it in the truck and let's put it out. So that's how I treated this whole thing, just like a news report, a big news report. So this has happened often, like you'll see like some news story that you're like, you know what, this is a movie waiting to be made. I mean, we're going to get to obviously the next one coming up, but <laughs> just in general, like... Yeah, I mean, I, and I have another one that I'm shooting next week, that same situation. Um, I don't know how much I can talk about it or not, but the same thing. I'm finding a niche in this, and I'm liking it. It's 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 fun, you know. So um, that's that's the new approach. I'm gonna do a couple more. And I might just you know slowly get out of it, but yeah, that's what we've been doing. All right. Well, I mean, and feel by the way, feel free to drop whatever whatever <laughs> news you want to drop on the world. And this is gonna go out. I'm gonna listen. If you want to <laughs> share, feel free. You know, we'll we'll be happy to take whatever news you got on that front. Oh well, so, I mean, for, for, go ahead. I'll say the next, and I can't really say more than this, but the next movie you'll be seeing is the actor that got chased around the city. And then we're going to leave it as that for now. All right. <laughs> Shouts out to, uh, let's see, what, what, name can, what, what name can we make up for him in a moment? I can't say oh. nothing, but you can say whatever you like. Bonathan Players? <laughs> let's see, something along, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It'll be fun to see what name you come up with with everybody in there. All right, so... That's funny. I saw the nurse who saw the baby by the highway. I saw this. Um, I didn't. I watched the movie. I kept it moving. Right. I'm just keep it moving. I was like, oh, interesting. Whoever made this is interesting to do that. Then I'm on. I'm on the Internet. I'm on Instagram. And then, boom, actually, somebody sent it to me. Somebody was like, yo, this can't be real. And I'm like, what is this? Because I see the title. The rap, let me just make sure I get this right. The rapper that got shot in the heel, right? Mm-hmm. I busted out laughing. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Like, I laughed so hard. But, and I was like, yo, I wonder if there's this new cottage industry or people just making movies like this because this title sounds just like the mm-hmm. nurse who saw the baby by the highway, right? So I was like, man, let me go. I start looking and I'm like, so for one, the first thing I did, I went to look for the movie. Turns out it's not even done yet. It's not out yet, right? It's not right, out right. yet, right? Okay. So I went to go look for it, but then I'm like, Oh, the same dude. I noticed the little uh, the, your your logo for for yeah. your Alvin Gray logo, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Yo, the same dude made this <laughs> that made that." Now it's funny because it was being billed, mm-hmm. it was being billed as a Tubi film, right. right? So it was being billed as a Tubi film, which we're gonna get to in a second because you had <laughs> you had to make a cut, you had to go on Instagram a couple times, do a couple of statements about you know like <laughs> one that ain't even out. Like y'all are, I appreciate that, um, right? So I see this and I'm like, I watched the trailer and I'm like, this is insane. Like one, I can't wait to see this one. 
Right. But I couldn't tell. I was like, is this? So I, wa- I know I watched the first. I'm like, okay, it's a little bit of a thriller. But yeah. so many people have had fun with the Meg the Stallion situation, which is what this yeah. is based on. Loosely based on, obviously, in the Tory Lanez one. But then I watched you do like a, a video where you're talking about how it's not meant to be a joke. Like, you know, you're hoping that people take something away from this. Mm-hmm. Um, so two questions. One, mm-hmm. who comes up with the titles? Oh, that's myself. Yeah. No, the reason why I'm, I title these things like that is because I don't know if I can say who it is, but I can say what it is. You know, so when I say things like, the first thing I saw on the side of the highway, we know who that is. The rapper who got shot in the hill, we know what that is. The actor who got chased around the city, we know who this what this is. But it's not like I'm I'm McDowell's and not McDonald's. You know, I'm I'm playing it sick. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. I never even thought about the McDowell's reference. Like it's they got the golden arches. Mine is the golden arcs. <laughs> they have the sesame seed bun. Right. We have no, we have no seeds. No whatever. seeds, right? There's no right, seeds, you know? right? <laughs> okay. All right. So, you, how? So when, how long had you been marinating on making that particular movie? Which let me point out, she got shot in the foot. Your your version got shot in the heel, right? right? So <laughs> we're making sure. <laughs> but like, how? So when when how long was it? How long did it take you to decide I got to make this movie? Like, I think once I saw the energy that came behind the nurse, I was thinking, and what is the next uh, most told story in our culture at the time? And it was that story. So I took that and was like, hey, let's just do it. Maybe it took me two weeks to get it all together as far as like the pre-production part of it. And within those couple of weeks, we shot it. It took me another th- four days to shoot that because we had to do a pickup day. It took four days to shoot it. I put it together, gave it to my distributor, and they're sitting on it again. <laughs> so are your friends and homies just waiting for the phone call like do you just have like a bat signal you send out to this certain group of actors and people i know your wife is i think your wife is part of the she's part of the is she part um, of the, the crew of people as well unofficially unofficially yes um okay. she 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 jumps in when i need her to jump in okay. um but yeah in, in baltimore we have a pretty strong team here of actors and crew members that are just anxious and hungry to work so uh, when we're available, when they're available, hey, come on the set. It's like an open clubhouse, and we just pass the camera around, we shoot, we light it, and we just get it done. Now, are you writing scripts for this? Are they loose scripts or like? Yeah, very. Um, so, to, in order to get these done in the pace we're getting them done, we do a lot of improv, you know? So, okay, right. I'll go on the set and say, hey, these are the moments we need to capture. These are the cue lines that are important. These are the moments that are important. Let's take this mood and run with it. And that's how. Um, the rapper that got shot in the hill, or the rapper who got shot in the hill, that's how that film became so heavy. Originally, it was supposed to be a parody, not let's say jokingly, but it was supposed to be lighter. But when I let the actors run with it, and I was also in it as well, and when I ran with it, we realized like this is a really heavy emotional story. Um, and we really got lost in those nights um, where it just came out a lot heavier than expected. But it was real, you know? So right. um, the tour, the story took a whole different sur- turn that we didn't expect. Do you make all your films at the same pace, like so quickly? Like, are you able to knock these things out that quickly? I would say, Once yeah. you have like the idea, is you're like ready to go? Yeah, like I just did a film um, in May called Check, Please. That's not out yet either. Um, I'm just trip- that's a whole different story, but the film I was, was going to ask you about that, by the way, but go ahead and finish this. I'm yeah. going to ask you about Check, Please. Yeah, so Check, Please was done, and we shot that in seven days. And um, I chopped it up and had it, you know, professionally put together. And uh, that took me total about 30 days, you know, with editing, scoring, and everything else put together. But that was a bigger budget, bigger production film. But I would say usually I can get a film done in roughly two to four weeks um, of the way that I'm doing it right now. I was going to ask about Check, Please, because there was like a I saw on, on like on your page, there was like a link to go watch the film. Like you could watch it through or the now I don't know if that ever came out that, and I missed it. But I, yeah. I was like, I was going to say this looks more. Like big budget produced. Yeah, it, was like more it looked like it had more money put behind it or more resources put behind it. Yeah. Like this was like your bit your theatrical release type of joint like it was that yeah. kind of thing was that that was that what you were going for with that yeah so i i like to explain to people these little films the, the the this trilogy that i'm doing the nurse the rapper the actor these are like my mixtapes in a sense you know i'm not really doing much with these besides just you know i'll create it put it out there and take it for what it is 
and then you'll go see my albums, movies like Sweet Dreams that I have out, or my show Risky Business that's on Amazon, or Check Please that's out. Those are the ones that actually, you can see like, oh, he really can put pen to paper. He really does write. He does real productions, you know, not just these jokes a lot. You know, I really make real movies. Um, it's just unfortunate that those are the ones that people don't know about because they're not as popular topics. But um, Check Please is available. Um, I put it on my website because my distributor uh, they they can't keep up with me, you know, and I I'm, I get impatient. I'm on to the next. I'm like, why is it still sitting? Right. You know what? I'll put it on my website where no one goes to buy it, so it's still not out because no one knows it's there. But um, yeah, I, those films are bigger productions. You know, I have a bigger crew, uh, better equipment. I have more time, um, and I actually put more money behind those. These other ones, I just it's a hobby project in a sense, but it's actually the ones that taken that take off more. It's weird. My mixtapes well, take off more than my actual albums. Well, but I mean, just like in the music, that's what happened all the time. People got loose on their mixtapes and have fun, yeah. right? And then everybody picks those things up. And then when people do their real art, it's like, oh, this, this ain't as fun as the mixtape. Or it's like, right. oh, now they're being serious over here, blah, blah, right. blah. I'm not the kind of director that's, that takes himself too serious. You know, I, I just want to entertain and have fun with my stuff. So whether it's a mixtape album, it's all going to be, you'll see my tone and you'll get a chip. You'll understand like, Hey, this is just an Alvin Gray film. I had a good time watching it. That's all. Don't ever take it too serious. Except for this, except for this next one, the, the rapper who got shot in the hill. That one was pretty heavy. Okay, Every time so I watch it, I'm like, damn, that's, that's pretty heavy. Every time I watch that. Like, what do you want people to get out of it? You're saying is, is deeper, is more heavy. Like, what do you want people to, when they finally get an opportunity to see it? Yeah, I just want people to really just think before reacting or acting. Um, and I realized in a pattern of all these movies that I'm doing in this series, that's where we all fall short. No one's thinking before they're acting. It is reacting based off of whatever the case may be. So I really want people just to see how quick things can change if you don't think before moving. You know, go. what happens if you go right instead of left? Just don't move freely thinking that everything is going to be the same either way. Cause it's not, um, and just bringing awareness to, you know, alcoholism and just mental illness and things like that. Things that I didn't even know that I was doing until it was done. And I'm like, Oh man, this is pretty heavy. Um, and again, that wasn't intentional, but that's what it became. Um, and I'm okay with that, you know, cause it's, I was still true to the art. I feel like I still feel like I didn't lose my touch, but you probably see a, a more sentimental heavier side to me on this one, this next one. All right. The uh, yeah. I gotta say the trailer looks great. Like with, I mean the y'all you nailed it. Like you from what I saw from the, on the trailer. Like, let's go. Turn around. Hands behind your head. <laughs> the the one the part that I think most people saw immediately was the the recreated Instagram live yeah. where I nailed that joint. I was like I'm watching this, and that's why when I first saw it, I laughed, and I was like. I think this is real. And I had to hit up. Them. I was like, I think this is real. And that's how I discovered you were the person that yeah. made it. I was like, oh, this is the guy. Yeah. So, And that's why I think people think that it's funny because it's so close. You know, it's like, right. we didn't say let's use red hair. Let's, let's, let's use blue hair. Let's use the hoodie. Like, I kept it so close to where people are like, this is so serious that it got to be a joke. And it's like, no, this is, this is real. You know, we, we really approached this with authenticity of channeling the, the 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 real people all right well we're gonna take a real quick break here on dare culture and we come back we have more with alvin gray we're gonna talk more films and tubi and the culture of tubi so stay tuned here on dare culture the 80s gave us unforgettable songs from bob marley de la soul and public enemy i'm a black and I can never be a veteran. Being Black the 80s is a podcast docuseries hosted by me, Torre, looking at the most important issues of the 80s through the songs of the decade. A decade when crack kingpins controlled the streets but lost their humanity. You couldn't be like those soft, smiling, happy go lucky drug dealers. You had to suppress that. They are just 
It was a time when disco was part of gay liberation. It provided the information to counter narratives that were given to gay people by the straight world. This is the funkiest history class you'll ever take. Join me, Torre, for Being Black the 80s on the Grio Black Podcast Network or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, we're back here in Dear Culture talking indie filmmaking, black movies uh, with writer, producer, director Alvin Gray, who made the viral sensations, uh, The Nurse Who Saw the Baby by the Highway and the upcoming The Rapper Who Got Shot in the Heel that exploded all over uh, social media. The poster got shared everywhere. The trailer I've seen. Um, how does that feel to go viral for things that you're creating, especially when you're saying these are like the mixtapes? Like, how does this how does it feel to go viral for that stuff? Um, it's a weird feeling, you know, because uh, I don't know. It's just, it's a really weird feeling because I never thought that these type of projects would be the projects that I actually be the ones that I get notoriety for. But, you know, I, I'm taking what comes and just riding the wave, I guess, in a sense. So it's cool, though. I guess still my money is the same. So I'm not like Scrooge McDuckin and coins and everything. So, so I think it's interesting that you're surprised that these are the ones, because I think they kind of, they like check the, the social media boxes, right. For like black culture, especially like this, this stuff is prime for black Twitter or black Mm -hmm. X, whatever we call it now. Right. Where it's like (laughs) a story we all were invested in and couldn't get away from. Uh, somebody made a movie about it quickly. And now we have this entire culture around Tubi that we mm-hmm. kind of like we mock, like we joke the idea of Tubi. Like, I wonder how many people actually know that Tubi is just like a regular movie platform. Like every right. major movie is on Tubi, right? It's just right. all the same movies on Amazon <laughs> and Netflix are on Tubi. But right. there's also the 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 movies that that show up on Tubi that you are going to get other places. And I remember mm-hmm. having a conversation with a woman who uh, I watched a movie on Tubi of hers. And then we ended up getting into it on, on Twitter mm-hmm. or Instagram because I, I had some not so nice things to say, but then she became the homie because I had her on my podcast to talk about it. So we, so she could get her bars off and I could, and now, you know, I check out all her films and everything, mm-hmm. but <laughs> like Tubi has become this space where we think that all movies that aren't quote unquote serious are Tubi movies, right? Right. Like, and I hate that perception because it almost makes it seem these are the not worth really watching movies. You just go check out the nonsense that's out there. Like Tubi is a platform for nonsense. Right, yeah. But then when people start tagging your movies as Tubi, because that did happen, like people kept talking about the rapper who got shot in the the heel as a Tubi film. And again, it's not even out yet. What is your thoughts on the Tubi verse as it exists at this point and being a filmmaker and an indie filmmaker and a black filmmaker? So people just kind of assume that the basically that Tubi is the space for that. It's it's so weird because people really think that Tubi are producing all these movies. You actually I follow a couple of Facebook page groups with Tubi and they're like, Oh, these are Tubi actors. This is another Tubi movie. And I'm like, what in the world is a Tubi actor on a Tubi movie? This is no different than saying, hey, that's an Amazon actor on an Amazon movie. Like, they're, right. it's just a streaming platform that people don't understand, um, which got me in trouble, by the way. It wasn't even my fault. Um, so everyone started tagging Tubi on this poster, saying, Tubi, y'all know y'all did wrong for this. So Tubi ain't S for this. And, like, and it went viral. Um, right. It was so viral that it went to the top of Tubi. And then they called my distributors and was like, we don't want nothing to do with this film. Really? We're not associated with this. Yes, we're not. So then they went out and put a tweet they, they, or, or X. I don't know what, what you call it. Yeah, but, I don't know what to call um, it. Yeah. They're like, that, yeah, that movie will be out ne- November, never November, February, February 18th. Tubi did this? Yes. And then they put another one under that saying, we would never put nothing out like that. Never will, never have. So my distributor calls me and says, hey, Alvin, whatever you're posting right now, you need to take it down uh, in order to save your relationship with Tubi and save your relationship with us. This is what they said to me. So I don't even want to talk about this, but whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't, really, I don't care about much. But um, so they tell me I need to take the stuff down. Tubi said they want nothing to do with the film at all. So now my distributors are scrambling because they don't know what the heck to do with the movie anymore because um, Tubi was like, we don't want nothing to do with it. I'm like, well, they've never seen the movie. It doesn't matter because the internet is blaming them for making this movie, poking fun at domestic violence. I'm like, but I put a post out saying this was not even about that, but Tubi was so scared, which to me, I'm like, okay, so 
They're not scared of showing a child getting shot in the head and, you know, I was about to say, I watch Tubi movies or movies on Tubi. Like, I do yeah. that. And yeah. I have seen some things on Tubi that, that yeah. again, I haven't seen the rapper who got shot shot in the hill yeah. yet. I haven't seen it. Right. But I have seen I've tons of movies on Tubi. And there's some things on there that yeah. this, I, I don't, again, I don't know what's what, uh, where it goes or anything. And clearly they don't either. Right. But I've seen but some nonsense. To denounce that, man, I think was crazy. You know, and I, I don't want to say something to too bad because I have other films on Tubi. Um, but to denounce that one and to do it how they did it, I feel like that was a little shady. Um, but then again, it's Tubi. So I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of honored, but at the same time, I'm kind of insulted that they did that. Um, so that's that's what that happened with that. Everyone kept saying it's a Tubi movie. They got bullied and they're like, we don't want no smoke. Um, so they said, we're going to pull it. And I'm like, OK, so y'all just ride the wave with, with everything else. But when someone starts to say something, y'all want to just be in the known and say we're going to pull it. I just I don't like how they did that. But it is interesting to me to think of Tubi not wanting that smoke. And I say that in the sense that one of the best things that's happened for Tubi is all of these people tagging these things as Tubi movies, right? Like assuming that if you want to go see shenanigans, Tubi yeah. is the place to go because now you're saying, like you said, there are, there are Facebook Tubi groups. There's all this stuff that yeah. people kind of put in the Tubi bucket and specifically go there looking for, right? So mm -hmm. if you if you say, hey, we need a crazy film to watch, some of them are like, man, go to Tubi. Like that's the right. na the natural way that people treat that. Right. So it's right. almost like it's free promo for them. Like it's been Tubi yeah. had a great year because everybody Tubi became this platform that everybody was like, go to Tubi for the for these things. You want to you want to see people get shot with no guns? Right. Go to Tubi. Go to you want to see all that? So <laughs> that's interesting that they would not like some of the promo because they. Yeah. But maybe it's because people are claiming the domestic violence thing. Like yeah. people still yeah. haven't seen the movie and there's still mm -hmm. all these ongoing arguments in the community about yeah meg versus tory and it was you know we touchy. kind of seen the darker side of for some men how we view this thing too like there's a lot of people who are very much like she had that coming whatever yeah. happened to her she had that coming tory right. lane has a lot of supporters or yeah so maybe part maybe it's part of that i guess i'm, I'm gonna shoot them a little bail and maybe <laughs> you know there's a little part of that it just seems crazy to me so i'm, I'm with you on it's that scary. it's kind of surprising they're really, they were really just scared. You know, the whole cancel culture thing is going on. And I think that because, I mean, that movie got shared in one day over 8 million times. You know, that boom, not even the movie, the poster. And they the were poster. probably tagged out of 8 million times, probably tagged 4 million other times. Right. They just were scared and just like, you know what? It's better to be safe than start. Sorry. We don't want anything to do with that movie. That's, I think that's how they played it. They played it safe. I'm just shocked because nothing about Tubi is safe. Um, so this must be really, really, really. Then I started second guessing myself. Like, is the movie really bad? Even on the one side, because that's to to accomplish that. Um, I think that's more to me. I'm more impressed by that part than anything else. In shots, because I'm like, wow, that's the movie is pretty. It's probably one of my better films, actually. Have you had a chance to like sit down with anybody at Tubi about that, or is that in the works to have no. a conversation? Of, have they reached out, or you all reached out to? Like, hey, can we just talk about this? Because I don't yeah. want because you do. I mean, you know, to some degree. Whether people like being tagged as a Tubi film or not, mm -hmm. Tubi is a platform that has a sizable audience now. Right. Yeah. Like that people, a lot of films go to Tubi. And from my understanding, Tubi pays more than other platforms. Yeah. Like it's one of the so it seems like you would want to maintain that relationship, even though you didn't destroy it yourself. That. Right you would want that to still be a, a platform that can, you know, premiere yeah. your film and all that stuff. Right. So yeah. it's, it's, you know. it's up to my distributor. Um, and I don't think my distributor understands. I don't think they understand, you know, um, that that's a whole different thing also with this, the, this, the disconnect between the distributors and the streaming platforms and their connection to the community. You know, everyone wants to profit off the community, but no one wants to understand the community. So, and I think that's where the problem lies for this particular situation. Um, Truby got scared, my distributor got scared, and it just said, F it, it just pulled it off. And um, that's where that went. So um, we're trying to figure out what's the next best move with that film. Um, but they're saying 100% that Tubi is definitely off the table for this particular film, but they still want to keep the nurse on the highway. They'll do anything else I do in the future. But for this particular film, my distributor is saying that Tubi is like, nah, we don't, we don't even want to look at it. <laughs> so, which is so strange. Do you think, 
I mean, you know, speaking about the community aspect, and I have this conversation with my friends a lot because, again, I'm a movie person. Like, I, I, I just love black movies, especially. <laughs> um, like, Clifton Powell is, like, my favorite actor ever. If my there's man. a movie with Clifton Powell, I'm watching it. And, you know, he's in, yeah. like, a thousand movies, right? So right. I'm always watching anything with Clifton Powell. Like, do you think, like, the 2B influence or culture that's created, like, does that help or hurt, like, black filmmakers? And, like, does that help or hurt the industry? Yeah. I think that it's actually helping right now. Uh, it's unfortunate that who it's uh, it's unfortunate that more black owners aren't involved with that platform, you know. But I think this is the first time where uh, black creators are able to express themselves truly and not have to fit a certain mold and still make money from their art, you know. So kudos to Tubi for doing that. And again, usually Tubi don't even know what the, what they're playing. They just take it and say, okay, it's selling. Let's just use it. It's just in this particular situation, it made too much noise. I flew too close to the sun, I guess. Um, but <laughs> usually uh, people, I've, I've seen more filmmakers, more colleagues of mine make more money with this platform than anything else I've ever seen in my half de decade and a half of filmmaking. So um, in one hand, it, they're doing the community service. But in the other hand, I feel like they're just uh, capitalizing off of something they don't even understand all the way. I mean, that's kind of the American way, right? Like yeah. you know, when it comes to black community and black art, especially um, right. everybody yeah. else seems to make more money off of our art and our creativity mm -hmm. than we do. Right. Correct. That's just, that's just unfortunately the way that works. Time for a quick break. Stay with us. And we're back. Let me ask you, you mentioned, so you've been, you've been making films for, you said the decade and a half. I've yet for a while. I stopped. It took like a five year break, but yeah. I, I, I noticed stopped. that. I look at your IMDb and there's like a window of time where it was like from like 2010, <laughs> 11, 12. It's like, and then it just stops at like 2012 and then it comes back. Yeah. Um, you know, one, what were you doing during that break? But what got you started in filmmaking? Like, what was your aha moment? I want to make movies. I want to make films. It was my reality as a child coming up. I mean, that was simple. I just didn't like my reality when I was a child coming up. So I used to always play with action figures and create my own stories. And as I got older, I just never let go of that habit. I just turned the action figures into real people and started telling stories to real people in high school, making little skits and jokes. This is before cell phones. I'm talking like the big cameras and everything. Um, and I just would get it on like public access television and get it played that way. Um, and I just kept at it. Um, then I went to the wire, you know, step up when they shot their hair in Baltimore, probably 15 years ago. And, um, I just watched how everyone was moving around and say, you know what? I think I can pull this off with me and some friends. So I just learned everything I could learn and, uh, just bought a camera and started making indie films with my little camera. That's pretty much how I did that and why I did it. You mentioned the wire. I was gonna. I was gonna go here. I was gonna go to Baltimore in general. But you. So you went to like the set. Like you were on set. Like watching what was going on, or yeah, like participating yeah. So, in any way, any capacity. The, so I mean, you'll see me as an extra. Like I was one of Mayor Carcetti's workers, like holding the sign and cheering him on when he won the election. And then I'm like in the background a couple times when McNulty is talking at the bar. So you'll see me in the background a Got lot. You. But I didn't really go there. Well, originally I did go there for the acting. But then I said, why am I fighting to be? in the background, the front of the background, because everyone said everyone wanted to be the one that was walking by. And I'm like, why are we fighting for this? I want a real role. So let me just see how they do it and just make my own stuff. That's pretty much how that became what it became. So you would start to see me on set more, but I wasn't there really to act anymore. I was there to learn so I can see how to be um, the front man. I didn't want to be an extra anymore, which is nothing wrong with being an extra. That's just not why I wanted to be at that time of my career, if I even had a career at that time. <laughs> so what what was the break? Why the break? Um, life life came. Technology started changing. Everyone started shooting on the DSLRs, the little cameras, and everything. Mm -hmm. It became oversaturated. Um, I noticed a change in people. You know, um, so people changed a lot from two thousand and four to even now. Uh, hear me out. So just the entitlement that people started to have, the easy access and the lack of appreciation of art and what went into it because technology made things easier. So with that, I say, you know what? I don't want to be associated with this type of environment and the change and the people and stuff. So I just backed away um, and decided to do some other stuff. And it wasn't until I got married, uh, when my wife saw some of my old films and she was like, I had no idea you even shot movies. Why did you stop? And you know, I just told her the same thing in a sense. And she said, you need to 
really look back into it. So I wound up taking my old movies from 10 years ago and reshooting them again, recycling and redoing them. And from there, um, it got more notoriety because social media had changed. And I just took that wave and I took my old knowledge with this new technology and made what I have today. That's how I'm able to create at the pace that I have because the hustle from 15 years ago is still there with this new technology. So how do you feel about the state of like black film and black filmmaking now? I mean, it seems like there's more more black movies than ever, right? Yeah. So whenever I, I love when people always say this thing like we don't have enough movies, I'm like y'all just ain't looking because right. <laughs> I there are a billion black movies out there. Like yeah. I don't ever have to watch a movie with a white person again if I don't want to. Like I genuinely <laughs> feel that way. Yeah. Um, now that's going to vary in quality from some odd to great, but that's how movies are in general, right? Like we we yeah. all assume that quote unquote mainstream movies are all like big budget and they're not right. Movies. Right. If you can make a movie, you, you could do it with $10 and some people do it with, you know, a hundred billion. Yeah. Right. It's just, yeah. it's just where you go find them. Yeah. But I see, you know, like I, I'm one of them people that I don't even mind the Tyler Perry end of things. Like I watch mm-hmm. all those movies because yeah. it's black storytelling. Now some of those movies could use some work, but <laughs> lots of movies can use some work. Right. So right. You know, where are you as a person who's in this industry, as a as a filmmaker who's actively working and creating? Like, yeah. where do you stand? How do you feel about think, the industry and where it's at right now? I think that, and, and I and I say, and I don't mean no offense when I say this, but I remember. So I remember when uh, DC Comics they did uh, what's that show uh, with the Titans? And this is when, I, and this is when I first started noticing a change. They turned the girl star, the the witch girl. It was a white girl in the in the comics, but. They made her into a, a dark skin girl on the in the actual show. And I was a little confused by that, but you know, went with it and I watched it and I said, you know what? Wow, she really brought a lot of more element to the character. Just the way that she carried herself, I wouldn't, I could not see anyone of any other race to, to to do that role that way. And that's when I first noticed it. And then I started noticing just the whole culture shift of a lot of black actors taking over certain roles in all these different movies. And as I watch these movies, I'm thinking to myself, wow, we as a people bring a lot more spice to the camera that grabs your attention than I've ever seen before on any other movie. Like to the point where I'm like, I don't even know if I'm, let me, how do I want to say this? I don't know if, I want to go back to the way things used to be as far as entertainment, the entertainment on a cinematic platform. And I'm trying to say things carefully because I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I do find that people in our culture actually bring a lot more spice to these characters that you just can't do with other cultures. And I don't say that in a mean way. I don't say it in a way to, to, to try to be like not or anything. I'm just speaking truth as a storyteller. Um, I'm happy to see the growth in the opportunity that we have gotten and we're giving, we're getting and we're creating and we're pushing through um, to show people what we really have. And I don't see us going back. And if we do go back, um, I think it will be a hard slope downwards for the uh, cinematic community because we're we're taking over and we're doing it really well as far as um, the performances that we're giving on screen, you know? So, and even as a director, these storytellers are out there, the stories we're able to tell um, I think that we're on to something and that it will be a I don't foresee us going down, going backwards. We 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 got, we had our foot in the door and we were able to excel and push all the way through at this point. So um I have nothing bad to say about it. I was originally I was like, I don't know about this, you know, we we we're gonna turn Kevin McAllister black. I don't know, but now I'm like, okay, I can actually see not saying that really happened, but right, I can right. see my five year old son being more of a terrorizer than the kid on the other side of park well i don't even know what i'm talking about but from the mansions you know what i mean I know, like I first just, off my best friend lives in west baltimore like ash burton i know i okay. know i've been looking for a little park hill strut in, in your in your movies i've been looking for it i've been looking i'm very familiar with baltimore I, okay. I, i'm one of the people in dc that actually really loves baltimore as a city nice so i appreciate so, that man yeah, I, I love but yeah, i think that he would bring a lot more terror to some criminals trying to break in his house than you know kevin from a mansion <laughs> So I just find I find that we are able to tell stories a little bit more exciting. And I'm and again, I don't mean that in any other way besides just the truth. Um, but yeah, that, that's how I feel about that. All right. Well, we're going to take one more <laughs> break here on Dear Culture. We're here with Alvin Gray talking black films, his black films, his films. And uh, when we come back, we're going to do my favorite segments, which are black fashions and black mendations here on Dear Culture. 
All right, we're back here on Dear Culture with Alvin Gray talking black films, talking Tubi, just talking about being an independent filmmaker. And we're here with the last segments of Dear Culture, which are my favorite, where we talk about black fashions and black recommendations. So black fashions are a confession about your blackness. Something people will be surprised to know about you because you're black. All right. Do you have a black fashion for us? Um, I'm not a I don't know anything about football and I don't know how to play spades. Is that- wow. Okay. So two for that's a two for. All right. Nine. So now when you say you don't know anything about football, are you not a Ravens fan? So no, so I mean, and I don't know if this is appropriate to bring up, but I was in the room, me and another person, another guy, and he's like, you know who that is? That's Ray Rice. I'm like, who's that? And they had to explain to me who that was. Um, I I only person I know is Ray Lewis. And I don't even know, I don't think he plays anymore. But other than that He does not. He's been retired for a very long time. He was in the Super Bowl in like the in like two thousand one. Okay, see, so, that's, that's the last. I, anyone else? I wouldn't know. I think I might know Flacco. Maybe about you don't face. know Lamar Jackson. No, I don't watch football. The most, like, wow. Okay, that's interesting. In a city where the Ravens, I would imagine, are one of the most dominating forces because they're good, and you have so many marquee players. That's interesting. Okay, for real. I'm in the grocery store and it was like, I'm like trying to buy like some wings or something on a Sunday and it never fails. Oh, so you're getting the, how about that game today? And I have to like go through this whole acting mode of me acting like I know what the hell he's talking about the whole time. I don't know what people are talking about. So I try not to go out on Sundays because people are trying to talk to me about the game and I don't want to be like, yeah, you know, go Eagles. And they're like, what? I always have to make up. So wait, stuff. Are you like an Orioles fan? Are you into sports at all? I am no way near into sports at all. I'm strictly okay. artist. Fair enough. (laughs) Explain the space thing, though, because, I mean, you know, you you a black man from one of the blackest cities in the country. Um, I would imagine space is a popular game in in Baltimore. I don't know. I I don't know how to play space. The only game I know how to play is Uno and maybe Old Mate from like back in the day. But as far as the jam, I was again, I was an artist. I was more into like weird like dolls and stuff you know because again i played with the stuff to uh create stories um so i just was not really a sp- i went i did a show um space tables like a month ago and literally we had to play spades while they're doing an interview and i knew nothing i had to like <laughs> talk the whole way through it's a club or a spade so what if i told you i don't know what a spade is just hypothetically it's you a- don't know what a spade looks well, like someone told me i had a spade nose like, one time, so i was kind of like okay hey, look, hold on let me see um so yeah people did you have a partner yeah but my partner i I, it was a rule i think i couldn't talk to my partner or something i don't know yeah you can't you can't talk across the board so your your partner probably hated you while you playing stuff on spades and they're like what is this fool doing yeah you gotta watch the interview man like they was like oh you're really counting out each card like i was trying to like stall (laughs) long as i could i don't know how i don't know how to flip cards i don't know how to do any of that stuff so it was an interesting interview Oh, I'm gonna have to go find out one because that's that's gonna be the that's that's something else right there. Okay, all right. So you're not a sports fan, uh, and you live in Baltimore, one of the the craziest <laughs> football towns in in America, because you're such a great team uh, with one of the blackest football players of all time, in Lamar Jackson. Um, okay, and you can't and you, you don't do spades. I think that counts as black fashions. All right, um, for a person who makes some of the blackest movies. In uh okay, I like it. You need to throw a space scene in one of your movies. Right. All right. Well, to usually to counter the black fashion, we have a black recommendation, which is a recommendation about black culture, something for by and about blackness that you think other black people should be up on. Okay. Do you have a black recommendation for us. Um is it can it can it be locally or is that to be like Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Wherever. Okay. Yeah. So locally, I think it's a stigma for black people to think that things like Botox and fillers and IV hydrations and just things in the aesthetics world is something that only people that are Caucasian should. And I think that we should break the stigma of not being afraid to look into Botox as needed, you know, and things like that. So I would like to just take the moment out to say, check out Gray Aesthetics, uh, which is a company that provides those services. She's a black provider and she loves to treat people in our culture and try to break the stigma to say that, hey, black does sometimes crack. and it's okay to say that. And it's okay to get those things touched up. So when I smile now, I don't have any lines or anything. I look, I look fresh like Hollywood. So my man doesn't play spades and said black does sometimes crack within two minutes of each other. 
I understand because gray aesthetics. I'm assuming this is is this your wife's business? Yeah. Or you're, you own yeah. family business, but you're okay. Yeah. But you did say black does indeed crack, and I just I think that's as much of a black fashion too. Um, I'm not even sure where to go from here. Um, I I've never heard anybody actually say black does crack. Yeah, it's, and, it, it sometimes uh, do. You know, like, um, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. That's funny, actually. That, but it's funny because that's that's like. That's like the perfect promo for a company on aesthetics, right? Like an like an esthetician, right? It's like, right, right. listen, sometimes black crack, and we got to get it back together. We got to, you know, put that. I I, res- I can just respect and appreciate that. Uh, so, wait, what's the name of the company again? Gray Aesthetics. Okay, in Baltimore. In Baltimore, yeah, in Baltimore, okay. we uh, do it all: lip fillers, you know, Botox, cheek fillers, under eye stuff. Um, you know, we frown a lot because of whatever the sun, because we're angry. Let's get them frowns upside down. Let's look fresh and new. All right. <laughs> All right. Listen, and I'm with you. I listen, I, I'm with you. I get it. A hundred percent. I just think it's funny saying like, like black don't crack. This is the one time it works in context yes. of making like, it works in context. All right. So listen. Where can people find out what you've got going on? You have a production company. Is it nine tenths or is it nine? Um, nine ten. It, it's the day that me and my nine. wife met. Um, was that September tenth? So okay, nine gotcha. ten productions. Okay. All right. So where can people keep up with what you got going on? A production company, the new films. Like, where can people keep up with what you've got going on if they're interested in? You said that the distributors are sitting on a couple films of yours. Do we have any idea when the world might actually see the rapper who got shot in the heel? Um, I would say go to my website, which is 910productionfilms.com. And if they don't do something soon, I'm going to wind up just dropping it on my website regardless. I'm thinking probably like the top of the month of February. Um, but even if not there, you can go to my website and you'll be able to find all of my projects, including my clothing line and everything else on that site. Um, and if you're not a website person like myself, I'm not really a website person, even though I have one. Um, social media, you know, I'm, I'm up with social media actively, like every five hours updating something. So, um, and that's the Alvin Gray. That's T-H-E-E-A-L-B-I-N-G-R-A-Y. You can go there and you'll be able to, you know, get up to date things as it's happening. My website, I usually update it every three or four weeks. So that's pretty much where you can go. All right. Well, thank you for being here on Dear Culture. Um, I look forward to checking out the rapper who got shot in the hill. Um, I I watched the other movies. Like I said, I watched the Christmas movie. Like (laughs) I love black cinema. Yeah. Um, I love cinema that centers blackness. Like I love anything that does black storytelling, even if it's even if it's bad, I get a kick out of it. Right. Like I I, just, I like entertainment. I watch movies for entertainment value. So when I can be entertained, I'm always happy by that. So uh, I will be checking out whatever you got going on. I'll be looking for those movies. Um, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you for creating. Thank you for no making doubt. art that goes viral. Right. Thank <laughs> so, you. <laughs> um, and whenever you know. you're ready, um, you know, for the next film, we can talk about that when it comes out. <laughs> Listen, I will be looking for it. Listen, we, yeah. we 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 just might have to do that because it might. <laughs> the film itself seems like it's a conversation piece in and of itself. Yeah, and sure. that there's nothing like having a movie that generates actual convo and all that. Yeah. So we'll be. I'll be looking forward to that. Okay, um, man. So yeah, appreciate you being here. Thank you, and thank you to everybody for listening to Dear Culture which is an original podcast of the Real Black Podcast Network. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong, edited by Jeff Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. Uh, Again, my name is Panama Jackson. Thank you for listening. Have a black one. We started this podcast to talk about not just what black writers write about, but how? Well, personally, it's on my bucket list to have one of my books banned. <laughs> I know that's probably bad, but Ooh. I think- Ooh, spicy. <laughs> they were yelling N-word, go home. And I was looking around for the N-word because I knew it couldn't be me because I was a queen. <laughs> but I'm telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, to start to live our lives and to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place.
My, my biggest strength throughout throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically black women. I mean, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was like a little kid. Like the banjo was blackly black, right? Mm -hmm. For many, many, African. many years, yes. everybody knew. Cause sometimes I'm just doing some Sam that, <laughs> cause I just like, <laughs> want to do it. An honor to be here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Keep shining bright. And we, and, and like you said, we gonna keep writing black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts.